Hello, Hidden Gems. It is Hidden Hour. We're so grateful to be with you today because we are going to talk about a new case, an important case, a case that John and I have been behind the scenes investigating extensively. It is the it is a very heartbreaking story. It is a story of Jared Bridegan. A, you've probably seen the headlines. Uh, the headlines are often uh, framed Microsoft exec data for gunned down, murdered in front of his two-year-old daughter. And that is all true, but we're going to definitely tonight go much deeper than the headlines. Three people have now been arrested in Jared Bridegan's death. It happened at Jacksonville Beach, Florida, as he was driving home to his home in St. Augustine. He had just dropped off his twins, his oldest children, at his ex-wife's home after a date night with them. He was returning to his new wife, who he had two young children with, the two-year-old, Bexley being the oldest, and then they had a six-month-old named London at home. And he called his wife, Kirsten, and said, I'll be on my way home honey. And uh, as he was making his way home, it was a drive he knew well. He was on a one-way street where the street narrowed, it, it grew darker, and there was a tire in the middle of the road. He stopped. He had no other choice but to stop. Um, uh, Bexley, again, was in the back seat, in her car seat. The moment he stepped out, he took one step out of his car. He was gunned down, shot multiple times in the back. Um, so yes, murdered in front of his young daughter who was alone for uh, minutes until help arrived. It, that happened, that date was February 16th, 2022. So it has been a year and a half since this young father of four was murdered. Since that time, three people have been arrested. The first person arrested was in January. A tenant, Henry Tenen. Is that correct, John? Henry Tenen? Yep, Tenen. The second person was arrested in March of this year. That is Mario Fernandez. That is Mary, Mario Fernandez Sal. What is the sec? Saldana. Saldana. And he was the new husband of, of, of Jared Bridegan's uh, ex wife. Shanna Gardner Fernandez. So all eyes turned to Shanna. Could you have done this? Could this, could you have really possibly been a part of this murder for hire that, that was starting to unfold? Uh, but no arrest, no arrest, no arrest until this month. And just a couple weeks ago, or just a week ago, uh, Shanna Gardner Fernandez was arrested, charged in her ex-husband's murder, the children of her father. Shanna Gardner Fernandez is an interesting character, um, and we have been delving into who she is and her past, and that is what we're going to talk about tonight. Before we begin, begin, and we're going to start with some body language in an interview that Shanna Gardner Fernandez uh, did, uh, the one and only interview since her ex-husband was murdered. But before that, I just want to paint the picture of this life that Jared Bridegan was living with his new wife and two new children that they brought into the world just, just to get to know them. And then, and then we will continue. Uh. I see your smile Tears right down my face I can replace Now that I'm strong, I've figured out How this world turns cold And breaks through my soul I know I'll find Deep inside me I can be the one I will never let you fall I'll stand up with you forever I'll be there for you through 
So that is the young father that we're going to be talking about today, Jared Bright again. Mm -hmm. And his new wife, Kirsten, has been fighting to see the children and to see justice for her husband. John, you suggested you wanted to start with some body language to introduce Shanna Gardner Fernandez. Yeah. we. <clears throat> We normally don't focus a lot on body language because, it, for one thing, it's not admissible in court. So I think body language analysis is always a very, very small piece of the puzzle. But I think in this case that the interview she gave, I think there's there's a really obvious read on body language here. So, uh, I, you know, the, the interview asks her the most pertinent question that everyone wants to know. And uh, let's see what she said. And along, he was still the father of my kids. So I asked Shanna the question. Did you have anything to do with Jared's murder? No, I did not have anything to do with his murder. All right, Dr. John, what did you see there? <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's discuss this. Now, normally I think body language analysis is, is fairly subtle, but here... She asked this question just point blank, did you murder him? And notice that her first response is to close her eyes. So it's, it's you have to, you kind of have to look quickly, but her first reaction to the question is she closes her eyes. And I don't mean blinking, I mean her eyes are closed. She's not looking at the interviewer. Let's, let's, let's watch that one more time okay, then. Sure asked Shanna the question. Did you have anything to do with Jared's murder? No, I did not have anything to do with his murder. Did you see yeah, that? I saw that. I'm going to rewind that. So uh, again, I want to, I want to stress that body language analysis is it's not admissible in court. It's generally not considered to be empirically validated. But uh, that doesn't mean it can't be interesting at times. And I, I think it's, it can be valuable if it's seen as, as a part of the puzzle, if it's, if it's seen as one small part of a larger puzzle. Uh, and so I think it's interesting. When I watched this initially, I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty blatant. You don't see that that much. And, and so yeah, she, asked the, she asked the question. You get her eyes closed right away. She can't look at her. Then she looks at her briefly then her eyes go to the left. She looks away again. So she's really, it's, it's, it, to me, it's very evasive. Now, I don't necessarily expect all the people I interview in forensic interviews to look at me directly because obviously there's different issues with how we learn eye contact and what that means. And there's certainly cultural considerations. But I think in this case, when you're asking a question, did you murder someone? And you close your eyes right away. That's that's probably not a good sign. So, why don't why don't you just play it again? Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. It's murder. No, I did not have anything to do with his murder. She did look to the side too. I saw that. Right. So she closes her eyes. Have anything for... to do with Jared's murder? No, I did not have anything to do with his murder. We didn't always get along. He was still the father of my kids. And then she lets us know they didn't get along. <laughs> right. So I, I think this is an interesting way to start the discussion of um, Shanna. And, and uh, it goes hand in hand with something we've heard. With One of the sources we've consulted, <clears throat> by the way, most of our sources want to be uh, anonymous, so we can't identify them at the moment. We might down the road, but one of our sources who's, who, who knows these families quite well told us that Shanna has, was known to be a compulsive liar, and we'll talk more about that later. But I think when you combine this idea that she's potentially a compulsive liar, I mean, we can't prove that. This is coming from one of our sources. But compulsive liar combined with this inability 
to look at the interviewer. She closes her eyes. She looks away. It's It definitely suggests that there's some evasiveness there. So it's probably not a great way to answer that question when that's the only interview you've ever done. So, um, so I think, you know, does, does that answer the question about whether she murdered Jared or participated in the, in the plot to kill him? No, of course not. It has to be proven in court, but it's, it's, it's not a great start. If you combine the fact that she's a compulsive liar with the fact that she's kind of her, one of her tells here appears to be evasive eye contact or, or a lack of eye contact and a very, very important question. Um, it's, it's not looking good. It's a tell, as you would say. It's a, tell. yeah, it's a bit of a tell. I, yeah. She's, she's probably not the best poker player. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't prove anything, but quite the tell. Yeah. Uh, and of course, as always, <laughs> everyone is innocent until proven guilty. In this case, there has been no trials. And in fact, there's not even right now a probable cause um, or an affidavit, arrest affidavit that we can read for Shanna because she is going to be extradited back to Florida. She was arrested in Washington and we are still waiting to read that. And, and Mario's affidavit is highly redacted uh, per the ongoing investigation, but there's still a lot we know. And yes, as John said, we've been talking to many, many people because Shanna lived an interesting life, a life that many of us are not accustomed to, a life of wealth uh, when it comes to her parents' family. Do you want to talk about yeah. that, John, or should I? Well, let's, let's, so in that same interview, she says, she says a lot of interesting things in that interview, but let's, let's take the next step in this analysis from that interview. And it, it, by the way, it's amazing you know, I, I I hope the people that that follow us know this, but it, it's it's amazing how, like with Rex Hewerman, you can take a five or six minute interview and learn so much about someone. And I, you know, maybe it's my profession. Maybe I'm you know I'm 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 in a interview room with a felon, and I have to extract as much information as possible in a fairly short amount of time. So I'm kind of hanging on every word and I'm interpreting a lot, but um, so I, 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 perhaps I'm trained to look for this, but it, it's really phenomenal how, if we really pay attention to what's being said and how it's said that we can really pick up a lot. So um, let's go a little bit beyond body language and let's stay with this interview. If you could play the next clip. Yes. Daughter sat in the car, strapped into her car seat alone for three minutes before someone came to help. I was shocked. Um, I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. Jared died in that street, leaving behind four children. So, again, she gives us one sentence, but what a sentence. Um <laughs> Let's let's unpack this a little bit here. So the question is, how did she respond to the news that Jared had been executed, essentially? Yep. Let's listen to it one more time. Okay. How did yeah. she respond to the news when she learned that her ex-husband, father to her twins, had been killed? His two-year-old daughter sat in the car, strapped into her car seat alone for three minutes before someone came to help. I was shocked. Um... I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. I fell to the floor because I was devastated about what I was going to tell my kids. Right. So first of all, this falling to the floor, that's, that might be a typical reaction to grief, right? But she doesn't tell us she doesn't fall to the floor in grief. She falls to the floor. We don't know why apparently grief, but she falls to the floor, and this is this is a really critical part because it, what's omitted here is more important than what she says. She falls to the floor because she's devastated for what she's going to have to tell the kids. So think about that. She's not devastated in learning about the execution of her ex-husband, who's the father of her children. That doesn't phase her at all. 
she's she's concerned more about what she has to tell the children, right? So to me, that's fascinating because it indicates that she really doesn't have much concern concern for her ex, number one. And number two, it seems like she already knew that in that moment, I mean, the interview, of course, is after the fact, but she's describing her initial reaction. I think she's giving us a much more honest response than she wants to. But the response is essentially, I knew that he was going to be murdered. I knew he was dead. So I really didn't care about him. I just cared about the kids. So she's devastated for having to tell the kids. She's not devastated for losing her ex, who happens to be the father of her kids and someone she loved. She's more concerned about the children. I mean, she should be concerned about the children, but the omission of anything to do with any grief or shock related to her ex is really telling. And, uh, and people are pointing out, well, we always worry about our children. I think then that the response would be, I fell to the floor because I realized that my children's father wasn't going to be able to love them. What she's worried about is telling them, you know, I'm sad because I'm going to miss him. He was such a good father. My heart breaks, but it was about how I am going to tell them. I think that's even more interesting. Um, Sherry's also pointing out, Sherry Douglas, this is probably the first time she maybe even considered how it's going to affect her children. If she fell to the floor, I mean, was she, you know, even thinking about that before? We'll listen to it one more time. Um, I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. Jared died in that street. There you go. Anything else, babe? I just, I, no matter what animosity you have towards an ex, it seems to me you'd have some grief for a deceased spouse, especially the way it happened. Right. And there's, there's just, there's nothing. There's just having to tell our kids and no grief, no mourning for the ex spouse. I mean, let me point out, I don't, you know, I wasn't there. We weren't there. This, this is speculation. You know, I'm, I'm clearly interpreting this and reading into it. Maybe she did have grief for him, but she certainly doesn't express it in this interview. So, right. And, and she's had months to think about this. She's saying this publicly. You'd expect someone who, who has slept on this for months, at least from a, a public relations standpoint, right. To, to say, I was devastated that I lost my ex-husband, the father of my children, and I was especially concerned for, how, you know, in breaking this horrible news to my children. Like, she can't even bring herself to say something positive about her ex-spouse in a public format. Right. Like, I mean, <laughs> that's true. He was such a good father. We didn't always, we didn't always get along, but he was such a good father. He was, you know, such a good man for my children. No. Yeah. Right. And Stella, right. Stella makes the point that there's no empathy and, um, you know, that there's no empathy for the kids. It's, it's, yeah, it, right. It's in the sense that she's worried about telling her kids almost as if there's an element of guilt you know, that there's a guilty conscience. Yeah. You know, she knows presumably, I mean, again, I'm speculating here and she's innocent until proven guilty, but seemingly this type of statement indicates that she knows that there was foul play. She knows exactly what happened or was supposed to happen, which did happen. And so she's not going to experience grief for him. Right. No grief. And not, and especially even the manner he was killed. Like what a horrendous thing, you know, right. who could do this to him? How could anybody hurt him? It's not just, Oh, a car accident happened. And I don't know what I'm going to do to tell my children. It's their father was like, who, who would do this to such a, such a man? Like I, you know, yeah, I agree. Agree. So it's, it's a really fascinating, you know, if, if <laughs> I don't know, somebody with a little more self-awareness, who's going to make a public statement about this is going to get a lot more sympathy or empathy 
if they say this was such a horrible thing, even though I didn't get along with my ex, I was devastated by his loss. It's hard for me, right? Like there's none of that. There's just, I don't seem to care about him. I mean, yeah, there was animosity in the relationship, but, but I mean, I, I don't know. It's just, it, to me, it's, <laughs> you know, to me, not only does it lack any self-awareness, but it's just absolutely indifferent to her ex-spouse. Agree. Agree. So it makes you wonder how she could have gotten here. How could we have all gotten here? Well, does it, right. It raises the question about, does she know? Is she, is she showing us right there that she knew and she didn't, she didn't have any grief because she knew he was murdered. Is she feeling guilty because she's going to have to tell the kids and she knows that she murdered him. Right. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It certainly seems like that's part of it. Again, I don't know. I don't know that this can be taken to court, but in the only public statement she's ever made, this is not the kind of statement that's going to show you in the most positive light or show, show her in the most positive light. So apparently she doesn't seem to know that, but, but it's interesting. Yes. She probably should fire. She probably should have fired her PR team, which apparently she had. I don't know. One and only interview she did. Um, right. Where and where would you like to go next, Doctor, Doctor Babe? Well, uh, how, uh, that's I think that's might be a question I have for you. What? Where do you think? Where should we start? Well, I think we need to unpack who Shanna is. Uh, again, I mentioned she was a child of wealth. Uh, her parents are the founders of a very well-known um, MLM, multi-level marketing company called Stamping Up. Stamping Up is a multi-million dollar company. Shanna was raised in a devout Mormon home. We have heard from distrib- distributors of the company as far away as Cambodia, who shared that um, due to the family's values and beliefs that worldwide, no one was allowed to have alcohol at any Stamping Up event. This was a, a religious family and a wealthy family. And Shanna seemed to toe the line. She was the youngest of five girls. And she served in a Mormon or LDS mission to Spain for 18 months, meaning that she dedicated herself for 18 months to the service of others. You proselyte and you also serve and help people with whatever they need on the mission. And then she came home. And she met Jared and married him fairly quickly in the LDS temple. So it was a religious ceremony and they were raising their twins um, in their joint religion. So from the outside looking in, it's hard to believe we got here, that there was then a divorce, severe animosity, and oh, and then the worst part about it, you know, years later, a, a murder. Right. So, yeah. So the, the question always, the question we always ask on our show is, how do you get to murder, right? Like, it's one thing to have a really angry spouse in a custody battle, but it's another altogether to have a spouse that's murdered in this type of fashion, right? So that's... That's what sets us apart. How do you get to murder here? Well, uh, so you mentioned the mission. Let's start with that. We we talked to several people that were that knew her from her mission, and they all said very similar things. I'm gonna I'm gonna read I'm gonna read a list of adjectives that some of the missionaries some of those sister missionaries that were in Spain with with Shanna used to describe her. So these are just a few of them, but here's. She she would have been Hermana. She would have been Hermana Gardner on her mission. Sister Gardner. Okay. Okay. And these are what people, yes, sister missionaries, fellow 
LDS Mormon missionaries who knew her the year and a half she was serving in Spain with her. These are words they use to describe Shanna to us. And, and this is when, you know, she was just, so she was younger, right? She would have been roughly 21 ish, 22, somewhere in there. She, so she, might... uh, they, she would have served her mission when she was 21 years old, returned at 22 if she went um, at the most common time to go back then when she went 15 years ago. Okay. So here's a list of adjectives. I, you know, I, I, I would be tempted to make some diagnoses based on these, but I won't. So I'll have, I'll have our listeners, uh, you know, kind of chime in and see what they think. But anyway, so these are some adjectives that multiple sources who knew her from their mission used to describe Shanna Gardner. And here we go. So kooky, nutty. She was off, mentally ill, unstable, moody, attention-seeking, controlling. Controlling was one that came up a lot. Controlling seems to be a predominant theme here. They also use the words entitled and spoiled. So one person told us that, and I think this is interesting and, and totally relevant to our analysis, but one person told us that Whenever Shanna was around, it was what she described as, quote, the Shanna show. That Shanna was always on stage. It was her show. Apparently, she was very attention-seeking. So on her mission, you didn't just get a mission. You got the Shanna show if you were around. Um, the one, one of the our sources told us that there were two elements related to Shanna again, this is on her mission, that that were well-known, that anybody who spent any time with Shanna knew, in addition to knowing about the Shanna show, they knew a couple of things. The first was that she made it clear all the time that she came from a family with lots of money and privilege. So you knew that she was from a wealthy family, and she would apparently put that out there all the time, um, which, by the way, I went to school... I went to college as an undergrad with some um, fairly well-known, ver some very wealthy people that were classmates. And the only comment I would make about them, so they came from what I would describe as more old money families. I don't know if I can... So one of the families that of the, of the person I knew that went to school with me as an undergrad, uh, one of the last names was Rockefeller. And in the Rockefeller family... This particular member of the family, he drove like a Honda Civic. He dressed very casually. You would, you would never in a million years know that he was a member of the Rockefeller family and that he was sitting on huge, a huge amount of wealth. Never would have known it. But here, <laughs> with, the Shana, with the Shanna show, you knew it because she would remind you constantly that her family was very wealthy. So um, I think that's interesting. You can, just because you come from a family with a lot of wealth and privilege, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to flaunt it or right. that you're going to know about it. That, that, that families, I think like the Rockefellers that have had money for generations, they're not going to flaunt it. So call it nouveau riche, call it whatever, but, um, but certainly, so that was one component of, of Shanna's mission is that she lets you know that her family was quite wealthy. She flaunted it. Uh, the other thing that you knew with Shanna apparently was this element of her being a little kooky to, to use the words of one of our sources that she did. She tended to do some fairly to quote the person. She did some fair, she, she would engage in sort of negative, negative behaviors and, we can't share the exact behaviors, but but it it suggested there were mental health issues. So when you're well, apparently when you were around Shanna, you knew that about the wealth, and you knew that she was going to be a little off. That there were some things that were going to be peculiar about her. And as the person put it, it seemed like her family wealth was the only positive quality she had to offer. That seems a little harsh to me, but I'm just quoting from our source. So. Yes. Yes. Um, 
And uh, people are bringing up some other interesting things about Shanna's family. Should we stick with Shanna first and then get into her? Um, well, you know, I think they kind of go hand in hand. So if you want to, if you want to jump into what are they talking about with the family? Well, they're bringing something up and, uh, that, that we have heard. Here you go. Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. The father has been married multiple times. Um, I know of two marriages for him, but may maybe there's one we don't know about. I know of two marriages. Shanna's mother was the babysitter and had an affair with Shanna's dad and ended up marrying him. That is, that is uh, what we have also learned from our sources that she was actually the 17 year old babysitter of the eldest daughter who is now Shelly's oldest daughter um, because she was Sterling's daughter, not Shelly's. So Shelly was the babysitter of, of Megan. And then, um, Sparks flew, I guess, <laughs> with the much younger babysitter, uh, the teen babysitter in this small town of New Harmony. New Harmony, by the way, is a very small town just outside of Cedar City. I remember I used to report there sometimes, uh, but very rarely because there are not many people there. It's a rural town, and it's actually um, also become a town um, where uh, near... Uh, Hilldale, Utah, um, Hilldale, Utah, and Colorado City are, are well known for the FLDS communities. Uh, those have been changing rapidly, and uh, many of those people are now going. Uh, many of the FLDS members are now moving to other areas, and New Harmony is one of those areas. So, um, just a little side note they, they grew up in rural Utah near the Arizona border. Uh, Kanab is another area um, that the gardeners um, live also near this area, beautiful area. Uh, so yeah, so that is how the family started. That is, that is the family origin, the falling in love origin. I mean, what does that mean for the family in general too? If that's the origins story. Yeah. I met, I met your mom while she was babysitting your oldest sister. <laughs> well, yeah, that's it. Right. It's an interesting story. I think well, I, th I think origin stories are always important because they kind of set the tone potentially for future generations. So when you have an origin story that's based on infidelity, I don't think it's it's particularly surprising that this theme of infidelity seems to continue to run through this family, or at least at least it runs through the family with Shanna. So, so you you right you kind of get the situation where the sins of the child or the sins of the mother get replayed in with the children as well to some degree here. And so, and that, which infidelity, by the way, turns out to be an important part of the story with Shanna and Jared. So, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but uh, what does it say? Well, I, you know, Shelly, Shelly Gardner has a blog that's apparently like a combination blog for stamping up and for the family. But the thing that she stresses all the time and the thing she seems the most concerned about is family. And she says repeatedly on the blog in many places, how important family is and how family is everything. And so it's interesting that you have this origin story where she's breaking up a family. It, it would be very confusing, right? Uh, well, it, you're right. I, I mean, if family is everything, then, then how would you, why start with, disrupting a family that was already intact at the point at that point when she was 17 maybe you could argue that she was young and naive and didn't quite understand the implications of what she was doing but if if family's everything and you're stressing the importance of family then it seems a little hypocritical to me to essentially destroy an intact family when you're 17 to marry the the husband at the time the husband that's not with you Right. right. So some people, a couple of people are, are trying to tell me that, no, it was in Kanab where this happened. Uh, and then they moved later to new harmony. Um, I am, you know, I'm definitely feeling insecure with my facts. So if that's true, I apologize. But for, so that people know Kanab and new harmony are both, uh, sent at both in Southern Utah area. 
not too far from one another, both very rural towns, beautiful areas. I used to report in both areas. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think, I think you have the scenario with the foundation of the family or the origin of the family, starting with infidelity. And it certainly seems like that motif continued on at least with, with Shanna. I don't know. We don't quite, we don't know as much about her siblings, her other siblings and their situations, and maybe they're all perfectly fine, but, but, but five daughters, the eldest is Sterling's daughter and the four younger ones are both Shelly and Sterling's children. Shanna is the very youngest and she came at an interesting time during this family's history. Um, the, so, so stamping up, some people are mentioning that uh, stamping up was going on when they met. It, it was not. Stamping up was started with Shelly and her sister in, in Kanab, Utah. And, uh, no, I think it was, it, it was started in Boulder city, Nevada. Oh, correct. Thank you. Yeah. Boulder it city, started Nevada. In, in, it was started in Boulder city, Nevada in 1988. And as, as long as we're talking about this, let's dive into something else that's relevant. So if we're going to try to figure out how does somebody like Shanna from this type of family get potentially to murder? And again, she's innocent until proven guilty this becomes a big part of the story. So Shelly and her sister, Vanna, start the company in Boulder City, Nevada, in a garage in 1988. Shanna is born in 1987, less than yes. a year, less than a year before the company was started. So you have a situation where Shelly, and Vanna are becoming extremely busy. They start Vanna's this company. Vanna's her sister. Yeah. Right. They they start this company. I think they're they're overwhelmed and surprised by the positive reception it's receiving. And it's not hard to imagine that Shanna is not getting that much attention. It's it, that Shanna is in some ways may perhaps feeling neglected. I mean, she would have been so young, she wouldn't have been aware of this, right? It would have been nonverbal, but, but it's, it's not hard to imagine that there might be some attachment issues that Shelly was spending most of her time or, or perhaps certainly the majority of her time with her other children, number one, when she had free time, but also on her business in particular. And so, so I, I, I think it's, it's quite probable that you have this element of neglect potentially that perhaps Shanna feels some sense of abandonment or some sense of rejection that I'm, I'm imagining that, that the reins were handed over to Sterling and I'm sure Sterling was a good father and I'm sure he did a competent job. He seems like a nice guy, but having said that, I, you know, uh, I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure he would be a good substitute for the mother well, and if she had been attached to the mother for a year, yeah. again, she was born in 87. It is really interesting. When I, when I first laid this out, I thought, oh, wow, she was born in 87 and the stamping up company starts in 88. John and I both know how much time it takes to start a business and a company. So, right. That would have been, that would have been difficult for a child to have that shift. Right. That, that she has her mother for less than a year and then she starts this company and it, it's taking all her time and energy. So there's the shift from being with the mom all the time to going to dad and perhaps dad filled that role equally as well, but it, it certainly would, either way it would have been a change. I don't know. And, and from what we've heard about Sterling, he's an exceedingly nice guy but he doesn't apparently seem to be the most emotionally connected guy. In fact, the family doesn't seem to be very emotionally connected. We'll get into that in a little bit, but I think this, this transition from Shelly and people have described Shelly as not being a, a particularly emotional either, 
But either way, this transition from Shelley to Sterling could certainly lead to some potential attachment issues, maybe insecure, you know, there could be some insecure attachment there, maybe uh, an anxious type attachment style in childhood, anxious ambivalent type attachment style in childhood. There might be some sense in which I think, and I, I think this does become a, a predominant theme for Shanna, which is this feeling of potentially of abandonment and rejection. And, and this is where it starts. I don't think it's, it's difficult to see that these two kind of go hand in hand. Banana lover. Thank you for your comment. Shelly 100% acts like she's making up for something with how she treated Shanna. Interesting comment. Yeah. It's just an interesting insight. Right. Um, right. And then so yeah. what happens if, if, if this child then feels abandoned or neglected or something goes wrong, you know, then what happens? Then the, the, I, I mean, a lot of things could happen. The child's going to have more difficulty finding an identity that makes sense to themselves. They're, they're probably going to struggle to kind of figure out who they are and they might struggle some with depression that they're not getting the nurturance they need. They're not necessarily feeling as loved or connected as they might. So they might struggle with some sense of belonging and, and feelings of insecurity and a lack of safety. I think that this becomes the most evident as this company becomes, as this company grows and becomes much more successful. Uh, I think what happens over time, and I, I don't know exactly when, but certainly it's, it's easy to imagine that in the beginning here that Shanna's just, she's becoming secondary to the business. And at some point when the business is, just making a ton of money, which apparently it does fairly quickly, that it's it's not hard to imagine that in this family that money becomes the main currency, that money replaces love and emotion as the 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 the, the currency that connects people. So yeah, it, that's it an interesting thing too. The the older children lived in this family when there was they were not millionaires. And now Shanna is raised in the era of money, the family has money the entire time Shanna is growing up. And right. so that becomes a bit of a currency to kind of control the family maybe like, or it's, it's the, it's, it's love. It's the show of love takes over. I think, I think you, 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 it seems to me you have a family here that struggles with emotions anyway, that, that they don't do great with emotion. And, and I think, so it, it's not, it, it would be easy for money to replace emotion as kind of the main currency. And, you know, this wouldn't be atypical. This is, you know, this, this, this is, would be a quite common theme in, in many wealthy families, by the way. So this wouldn't be something that would apply exactly to the gardeners. But I think what, yeah, I, what you said is, is, is completely pertinent in the sense that the dynamic here applies mainly to Shanna in the sense that the other siblings aren't accustomed to this kind of wealth, whereas Shanna only knows this love. By the time she's verbal and she's right and she's in kindergarten or some of her earlier grades, this family's already made it. They're already quite successful. So I think at some point she you know, she becomes accustomed to the fact that people aren't necessarily going to be there for her, but somehow money can make up for that, that, you know, whether that might be babysitters or whatever it is, caretakers, I don't know. Right. Money, money, her family won't necessarily be there, but money will. Right. Right. And, and, and she even can use though, money, the family use money. And we know that there, 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 there were stipends for things, everything. There was a large allowance. Go ahead. Sorry. Right. Yeah. I mean, over time, right. As the wealth continued to accumulate and, and Shanna became older and all the, all the children became adults. Apparently there were the family, which means Shelly, Shelly and Sterling, but 
probably Shelly in particular, because Shelly is the one who eventually buys out the company from Vana and has complete control of it. So Shelly's the primary owner and leader and executive of this company. But they set up a system apparently where the children would earn allowances, I guess, early on, but stipends when they were adults. So they would get money for reaching certain goals or milestones. Like if you got married, you got an X number of dollars. If you had children, you got X number of dollars. If you had, right. It Like when I heard this, I thought, my first thought was, holy cow, they're, they're running the family exactly like a business. Like what it's talk about replacing emotion or love with, with money. I mean, that's literally how you would do it. Right. And, and, uh, it almost sounds to me like it sounds like a performance incentive type system, right? That that they're applying to the family. You know, you do this, we'll give you a car. You do that, we'll give you a check. You right? Like, um, you know, you have to. You wonder if instead of having like family meetings, they sat down and did like performance reviews, and Shelley was the supervisor or something. So that would be like. So next time we go on a date. Lauren, just I might have to set up some type of performance review or give you a report card after the, the date. So just and you and likewise, I guess you I was gonna say, well, then yeah. watch out because I've got a list. No, I know, yeah. I might I've I might got have a performance to, list I'm writing, so we can exchange. I might have to be careful. Decide, I might have to be uh, careful. Yeah, decide don't what you're worthy of <laughs> allowance wise in this family. You yeah, want more, you want more books, John? You're gonna have to. I'm gonna have to earn it. My honeydew list. <laughs> right, I'm gonna have to um, work towards bonuses, I guess. So, but but in this family, they did that. You know, there were there were stipends that. So it, so that's, you know, so so I don't know. It's I shouldn't laugh about it, but I mean, it's I don't know. It's just so calculating and so business-like, you know, there's just, um, there's just something, uh, I don't know, so cold about it. And, and, you know, one yeah, of the as people, Liz says, as Liz says, it was their love language. It, it was, was their love language. Business oriented love language. Yeah. You know, I agree. That's, I think that's true, Liz. Um, but I think it's kind of a sad commentary or a sad situation when the love language is is a language that involves buying and selling things and not connecting to people you love at an emotional level. And so I think um, so that becomes like this. Yeah. And I like this uh, VC home. That is an MLM compensation plan <laughs> right there. And so, and so, but so as long as we're on this, let's, let's continue with this because this becomes a big part of the story. This becomes a big part of the story of, of Jared and Shanna and how they met and how they got married. So let's stay with this theme. Um, so one of the things we learned apparently was we don't have this letter, but there was a letter on the mission. So Shanna had completed her mission, right? And she she apparently wrote this letter or maybe several of the mission, missionaries that had left. Do you know the exact story? They, yeah, yeah, and I'll letter. explain it too. So, okay. so yeah, when you, when you serve an LDS mission, there is a mission president, an older gentleman over the mission. He's married and has a wife, the mission president's wife, mission mom, as she's sometimes known. But this is a couple that that are sent to also serve a mission, but they are over the uh, hundreds or of, of missionaries, young missionaries in an area. And as a Mormon missionary, you get to really know uh, the couple. They, they check up on everything. Uh, they they choose who is going to be a companion or a roommate or partner to the other missionary. Um, they put sister missionaries together and they put elders together, and uh, meaning the boys, the young boys and the young girls. And they choose who are going to be roommates. They take complaints when two companions or roommates aren't getting along. 
They uh, learn when they are doing wonderfully. I mean, they know the ins and outs of all of these young missionaries on the mission and keep tabs on them. And they do oftentimes act parental. They are uh, parental figures because some of these people are young, especially the boys leaving home for the first time. And uh, they, they take care of the mental health, everything. So Shanna goes home and the, the missionary mom uh, lets all the other sisters, and we've learned that there are only about 22 sisters in, in the country of Spain serving. So the sister missionaries uh, were a much smaller group. So they were really close knit. They were really tight. So they wanted to know how all the sisters were doing that had gone home, that they'd all gotten to know. And the sister, uh, the, the missionary mother pulled them all aside while they were all together on a day off and said, well, here's a letter from Shanna. Shanna, um, you know, Hermana Gardner is sharing with us a terrible date that she has had, a bad date. Let me read to you all the letter. And they all read the letter and they all laughed about this letter and Shanna's bad date. And then what happened? Another letter came from Shanna. And this time she's letting her mission mom know and all of the, the, the sister female missionaries know that she's now engaged to her first date that was terrible just weeks later. So but before... And that would be Jared Bright again. Before we get into the, I want to get into the letter a little more, but before we do that, you have in the body cam, I wanted to play the body cam footage to kind of reinforce this point we're making about the importance of business and money. Could you, could you maybe put that up? Sure. So before this, okay. So, so then we're going to take a pause there and we're going to get back to that. So put a pin in that, the body cam footage of Shanna's arrest this month just came out. In fact, we have it on our Hidden True Crime YouTube channel, the body cam footage of Shanna's arrest at her home in Washington. And this is, it was both, both mine and Dr. John's, we watched the body cam footage separately and we both thought to ourselves, this is the most interesting part of her arrest. So, so to, to set the stage, because we're only gonna watch this little part, she's at home. Her, her twins are there. That's heartbreaking. She has 12-year-old twins. They're there. Her mother, Shelly Gardner, who we've been discussing, is there. And uh, that's who we know. And then, of course, a bunch of um, F it's FBI federal. So here we go. The most interesting part. Make sure you mute, John. Yep. We, we can stop there for now. Abby is her 12 year old daughter, by the way. You're, you're muted, but while he unmutes himself, what she's saying to her young daughter as she's arrested, you have orders on the Instagram Have grandma help you in. Go ahead, John. You want to, okay, that's good. Do we, do you want I was just going to ask if you wanted to play it again. Yes. But, let's okay. play it again. Grandma help you get into 
So I thought it was fascinating, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And then you watched it and you gave me a mouthful, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I wanted to play this before we forget, as long as we're talking about this theme of business and the family being like a business and valuing business and kind of lacking emotions. I can't think of a better moment to show than this. And... My mic's on, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, That's why I'm nodding. So, so let's think about let's think about this moment and that comment. Let's step back and think about this, right? So, you have an arrest going on here. That means potentially that so, Shanna may never ever get out of jail or prison again. She may never see the light of day again. She might, but my guess is might that not. there's, right. There, I think there's a good probability here that this may be the only moment in the free world where she sees her children for the last time. Now, I don't know about you. I, I presume this would be true of you, Lauren, but I don't, I don't want to speak for you because I don't want to lose my stipend, but the too late. Uh, okay. I, I'll, have to, I'll have to make it back. Just kidding. Um, You'll get your stipend. Go ahead. So if I'm in this moment, number one, I'm going to be emotional. Like I'm going to be so emotional and I'm going to be thinking I may never see my kids again in, in this time, you know, yeah, sure. They may come visit in prison, but I'm never going to see them in this environment in the outside world ever again. The last thing I'm going to be thinking about is you have orders to fill on Instagram. I'm going to be a mess and I'm going to be saying to my kids, I love you guys. I'm going to miss you so much. I can't, you know, I'm so sorry that this happened, right? Like what, what would a normal part? I can't, like you get, you get no emotion from her. Not only, not only a, a total lack of emotion, but you get this concern about filling orders on Instagram relative to the fact that you will have someone with a high probability of spending the rest of their days or maybe even getting into the death penalty in prison. And this is what she's thinking about. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. Um, yeah. And it wasn't, uh, as we've heard as well, it wasn't a stampin' up order. Um, right. Her daughter was selling something, but who the hell cares? Right. In the, who in cares? The, in the grand scheme of things, she is never, she, there's a high probability. She will never see her kids in that type of environment ever again. And this is what she says. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. So, Again, this I think this reinforces this idea of a family culture that's very focused on business. They're focused on money. They're focused on power, right? They're not focused on connection and emotions and attachment and all the things that might go into making a healthier family culture or probably a healthier human being too. So so this is a right. good example of it. So let's go back to the let's go back to the story that we were starting to talk about and I'll explain how that's relevant. But the, so actually the, the, the letter that Shanna wrote for the mission companions was, it was called the, the worst first date ever. And the worst first date ever, as Shanna described it back when she was on her mission was with Jared. And yeah, that's what she the, wrote. And the reason it was she considered it to be the worst first date ever was because essentially, just to summarize it quickly, because Jared was not into her. Jared did not apparently Jared wasn't feeling it. He wasn't he wasn't particularly attracted to her. It didn't look good for Shanna in terms of getting another date. And but so this is where this gets interesting. So Jared is on the verge of walking away. And Shanna becomes aggressive and starts pursuing him. 
And she starts showering him with gifts. She starts engaging in all the things you'd expect someone with money to do that's, that wants to apparently woo you over with or impress you with your wealth. She's She shows up in nice cars like Porsches. She's taking them on trips with the family or they're going on these expensive junkets, which by the way, continue. Those, those go, this family goes on vacation all the time. Actually reminds me a lot of like the Cox family, by the way, but we're not going to, we're not going to get into that, but she's, she's whining and dining. She's whining and dining him. And so as, as one of our sources put it, Jared felt like he won the lottery. He didn't win love. And he was never really into her, but he won the lottery. And so this is how somebody like Shanna can use her wealth and her family influence to, and it worked, sadly, but to attract somebody like Jared and to get him to marry her. Now, unfortunately, there's a real downside to to this type of romance because this type of romance lacks any type of emotional connection or emotional foundation. And so when they got married, the relationship started having problems. They had, they had twins and that was a really, obviously that was a wonderful element of this marriage or something that came out of this marriage. But because there was really no foundation and because Jared really wasn't into her, ironically what happened was that Shanna began having an affair Shanna. Well, really quickly, I want to also clarify some things with Jared. Jared okay. wasn't purely marrying her for the money. He was also in a very vulnerable situation. Jared was young. Jared didn't have even his schooling done. Jared was, um, by all accounts, he had just gotten back from a mission himself. He had had to have left because of some health issues a little bit early, which... I assume that probably caused him shame. He wasn't at the top of his game. I've also heard from um, another source that uh, this is not the first time Shanna was aggressive and obsessive with men, that there was another young man who the entire family, it was a family affair to get people married. Shelly got involved. Sterling got involved. I mean, the sisters got involved to get somebody to marry in this family. Remember there's stipends too, allegedly. <laughs> right. But, Significant uh, stipends for marriage. Yeah. Yeah. So there was one gentleman who discusses being wooed by the whole family, like courted almost like by the entire family that they all wanted him to marry Shanna. And he feels like it was a relief. He got away because there was pressure involved. It's not just like, Oh, I've won the lottery piece out. Here's a very, very young I, almost like a child, he was so young, vulnerable, and not just an aggressive female, but a whole family sort of backing that up, taking him on vacations, letting him know he's loved, letting him know he's part of the family. So I guess I just want to lay the stage here. This wasn't like a someone going, oh, I've got a sugar mom, and that's what I'm looking for. He was a very yeah. vulnerable young guy who had never really had a really long-term relationship before they never even lived together until they got married because it was a religious wedding. Go ahead. I just yeah, really want to right. clear that up. Thanks for clarifying that because right. He wasn't using her in any sense. I think he was, he was young. He was vulnerable. He was confused. He had never experienced this type of, of wealth or lifestyle. He just, right. It was, he was, as somebody pointed out in the chat, there was love bombing going on. She was telling him repeatedly how much she loved him, how she couldn't live without him, right? He was very confused by all this. Correct. And so, and so it, it, I think in these types of situations, oftentimes, and also I should point out that, that people pointed out that we've heard that, that, that Jared was a really nice kind of overly compliant guy. He was the type of guy that had a hard time saying no. And so I think when you're, when you're bombarded with this type of aggression, right. And, and this type of love bombing, if that's the term we're going to use this type, this type of persistently aggressive pursuit of a romantic relationship, it's hard. It sometimes it can be hard to say no. So I think this whole scenario was extremely overwhelming. 
to Jared. Correct. So yeah, see what this was not a case of of a forty five year old male saying, "Let me jump on the you know, let me jump on the wagon here and, and use this woman." That was not the case at all. This was somebody who was very young, somewhat naive, probably very vulnerable. He was definitely a bit of a people pleaser. I think he just didn't see a way out, to be honest. Correct. I'm having a hard time, by the way, putting uh, comments on YouTube right now. I hope it's working for everyone else. But I also want to say when you're 20, you don't ever know what you're doing. You're learning life <laughs> lessons. You know, someone said hey, he knew exactly what he was doing. No, when you have an aggressive person and they're Mormon and you're Mormon and the families are like, this is good. I mean, think shiny, happy people. And then you're wanting to please, you know, right. Exactly. You live and learn. So he gets married and this is where I think this is where the story becomes, this is where the story starts turning a little bit tragic is that Shauna was never really interested in him to begin with. I think she just, she didn't want to be rejected by him. She couldn't believe that he wasn't into her in the way that she anticipated. And so usually in these types of situations, especially if there's someone with a potential personality disorder, which if we go back to the list I read of adjectives, my guess is that you're probably talking about some kind of personality disorder, or at least ballpark, probably some of the cluster B personality disorders like narcissism or borderline personality disorder, one of those. I'm not going to try to diagnose here because I don't know enough, but but my guess is that you're looking at you're you're probably looking at something like a personality disorder, if not a personality disorder. And in those types of cases, this becomes a game in the sense that if someone is rejecting, so in this case, if Jared is rejecting her and she can't tolerate it, because she's if we go back to the fear of abandonment as a child and those attachment issues. She needs to win. So she wins. She marries him. Now she's getting bored. Now she's not finding him interesting. So after so, several, several so in years. So in other words, it explains this first date phenomenon. It was the worst date ever because he wasn't into her. Yeah. But that, as Jesse says, the rejection is exactly what fueled her. Exactly. And she made the decision, I'm, I'm going to get him. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Okay. The, je, je, right. It's, it's. It's the pain and the wound of being rejected as a child that Shauna, Shauna is trying to cover up. She's trying to, right, that's what, that's what she's compensating for with Jared. But, but the way that's going to play out is not in a healthy manner. So when she has the upper hand, she apparently she joins a gym, a CrossFit gym. She gets really into it she, because she convinces Jared that – or I don't know she if she wants to lose him. the baby weight or, you know, yeah, they, she wants to lose some baby weight. Some weight. Yeah. They've both gained some weight in this marriage happens, right, babe. Let's try some <laughs> stipends and see yeah. what we can figure that out. But yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, right. And yeah, <laughs> let's not get into that. COVID doesn't help either, but this was pre COVID. So I'm going to blame it on COVID for me personally, but anyway, um, three years ago, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, some things are hard to change. Um, okay, but anyway, they gain some weight. She wants to get fit. She joins a gym. She wants to lose some weight. She meets a trainer. She's smitten with this guy, Falls apparently thinks she falls madly in love with them. So now that she sees this as an opportunity to reject Jared, which she does. She's the one who files for divorce. She tells him she's leaving him. And now... By the way, by her rejecting Jared, she's come full circle. She's now she's she's not being the one that's rejected. She's doing the rejection. And so she's got the upper hand now, right? All in her mind's eye, she's completed this cycle. She's won this little game or this round. Never mind that she's got twins and she's really hurt Jared, but Right. But this is this is this is how it plays out. And now that she has this trainer, she feels like she has the security blanket of just switching from Jared to the trainer. And unfortunately, 
after um, almost immediately after the divorce, she tries to get serious with the trainer and the trainer leaves her. So, so she, she just is. went from the upper hand to the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> right. So unfortunately here she is rejected again. And oh yes, the story gets worse because Jared, this is when Jared meets Kirsten and Kirsten turns out to be a really wonderful human being. And they have from what appear, from what we understand from talking to people and, and looking at the Instagram accounts, they have what looks like a, a really storybook type marriage and relationship. And, and Jared Shanna's, finds love again. Jer and not again, Jared actually tells this woman, I don't know if I've ever had love before. I imagine Jared didn't feel too great after this marriage either. I don't know what it was like, but she cheats on him. She leaves him. He has two children. Bye bye to um, that's, you know, that the wealthy trips and jet setting. And here he is, I'm sure young, wondering if he's ever going to find love again. I just assume, I mean, divorces are devastating, but, but he does, he finds love and she gets kicked to the curb by this personal trainer. He's like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You know, it was a fun little fling, but, but I I've moved on Shanna. I've got, I've got other fish. To... Well, not not only moved on, but he's found a lot of happiness, and yes, there, and there's started another an entire component. new family. Started a whole new family. There's another component to this, which is really critical. So you have, so Shanna's being rejected by this trainer. So here she's back to being rejected, which is exactly what she wanted to avoid, and she's noticing that not only is Jared happy. But the contrast with Kirsten is enormous in the sense that I think she senses like everything about Kirsten. And I mean, I don't know Kirsten, but just from looking at her talk and like kind of just assessing her body language and, and how she comes across and just some of her actions and behaviors and the Bexley box um, uh, foundation, like this is someone I think that Shanna senses is much more able. She's much more confident. She's much more expressive with her emotions. She's a good communicator. In many ways, she's precisely what Shanna is not. And so, exactly. so you have, you have not only someone who's, who's a real good, uh, excellent fit with Jared and who's, can, you know, who's a part of a very happy marriage, but you have someone who by contrast, I think in many ways has almost all the qualities or many of the qualities that Shanna envies and wants. And so you have, now you have these two prongs of rejection by the personal trainer and Jared in his new life, which is making her envious. And this is all going to be a setup for a really nasty custody battle. Because honestly, there's no reason for this custody battle. Except for, there's one reason for the custody battle. And that is that Shanna wants to create waves. She wants, and she wants to really harm Jared. And she can do it because of her wealth and the support from her parents. She couldn't do this, by the way, if her parents weren't supporting her. So the financial support from her parents is essentially funding seven years of this of, of the most contentious hateful custody battle that doesn't need to occur but does so the most contentious custody battle you could ever imagine for no reason other than she wants to undermine Jared's happiness his marriage stability she probably really has some strong dislike for Kirsten right she's been rejected she finds she ends up with Mario which comes a part of the story too but Anyway, I think yeah, that control. Can we even sum it up to control? She's jealous. She's envious. Yeah. She's feeling rejected. And the custody battle is about control. This is a way she can still control him and the situation. Right. Exactly. That she's, she's just not going to let go and she wants to hurt him. So, so I think, 
so these would be the essential ingredients that that would eventually, assuming that she did, she did mastermind this this murder plot. These would be the ingredients that are now starting to fall in place that are going to lead to murder. Yes. So I think if the question is how do you get to murder now, I think we're starting to get pretty pretty close. If you if you throw in the fact that <clears throat> excuse me that after she's rejected by the trainer, she finds Mario. She marries him. Mario is, to quote the arrest affidavit, he is, quote, a maintenance man, unquote, who works at the CrossFit gym. She meets him, and I I guess they fall in love. They fall in love. They get married. Um, uh, There's a story about Mario. So if you want to know a little bit about Mario, I think this story is all all we really need to to know. And the story is that, Apparently in Mario's neighborhood, there's a woman, one of his neighbors that, that feeds stray cats. She has a real soft spot for stray cats and she goes out and feeds them. And for whatever reasons, this really upsets Mario. He's incensed by this. He can't believe that one of his neighbors is supporting stray cats and feeding them and being kind to stray cats for whatever reasons. So Mario goes out with his pit bull Surprise, surprise, Mario has several pit bulls, by the way. But Mario goes out with his pit bulls, and he tries to intimidate the neighbor to not feed the cats. And he apparently there were some threatening comments made about the pit bull and the neighbor. I don't know exactly what. We don't have that police report. But the neighbor did complain. The neighbor did file a police report. So there is a little bit of a... Uh, there are some criminal complaints on Mario. He has some fairly minor infractions like this. Of course, Mario just Mario described it as just going out, taking his dog for a walk. But mm-hmm. the neighbor clearly didn't see it that way. So, but the point is that that Mario is someone with some history of aggression, some history of intimidating other people. I don't think that. I don't think so her landing ending up with someone like Mario I I don't think it would take much to buy his loyalty with her type of wealth and her need for control I think Mario is someone she could probably manipulate fairly easily uh so I think Mario seems like kind of an easy mark for her uh I don't know if she's finding him to help instigate these crimes. I'm not, that's not clear. I, it doesn't seem like that was her initial intent here. I think it may have evolved into that, but, um, but it, it, it's not hard to see this guy. Mario is kind of a dupe who, who, you know, ends up with the, the, the rich girl for all the wrong reasons. And, and we know that she's the aggressive one. You know, she oftentimes is the aggressor, the pursuer, the, you know, look what I can do for you. So it happens all over again with Mario. A lot of people are mentioning um, some changes in Shanna as well. Mm-hmm. Um, while, of course, there is nothing wrong with getting tattoos or, or body piercings, that's not necessarily the thing that people are speculating over. It's the changes. This She went from a... A uh, very conservative, Mormon, religious, uh, you know, LDS missionary to then the moment she divorces uh, Jared to getting an entire sleeve tattoo to um, genital piercings that we have confirmed those rumors and uh, just a lot of a lot of unique changes when it comes to the way she was raised and acted prior to her divorce. What's that about? Well, I I think, yeah. So I, I, I think she's acting out. I think she's rejecting a lot of her family culture. I think she's clearly rejecting the church. I think probably to a large degree, she's felt really repressed by her family culture. And so, I think by rejecting Jared, she's sort of rejecting 
her Mormon past to a large degree, and maybe she feels some degree of freedom. I don't know anything about this trainer she's having an affair with or did have an affair with, but perhaps he's not LDS like Mario. He's not LDS. Perhaps he's a little bit more on the wild side and she, she, could, she wants him to relate to that and her, right? There could be a lot of reasons why she's doing this, but I, I think the fundamental reason is she's really rebelling against her family and the church. And so it's, of course, it's ironic that now her family is swooping in to really help her at all costs. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Um, yeah, it's just an, an interesting part of the story as well to see that shift a, 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 re, a late rebellion of sorts. Yeah. And it, it's, it's possible to imagine that if there is some type of personality disorder that perhaps she kept it under wraps to some degree previously, knowing that the, that the, there was this controlling element of her family culture that she wouldn't get these stipends if she acted out, right? Like there, she was getting a lot of rewards from- For not acting out. For not acting out, for playing by the rules, playing by the expectations. And one thing we know about Shelly is, Shelly was a very rule-based leader. Shelly was very right. concerned with, well, for example, you, you mentioned this, that they have, a, that they have a strict rule in Stamping Up that if you attend a Stamping Up conference, which all ML, MLNs have these, you know, crazy, right, leadership conferences every year, or cruises, in the case of Stamping Up, that they weren't allowed to have any alcohol whatsoever at any of their conferences or on any of these cruises in accord with kind of Mormon, right? And yes, people brought alcohol. Someone mentioned that, but, you know, they not weren't obvious. They weren't supposed to have it. They weren't supposed to have it, yeah change right. on those yeah yeah right she, <laughs> shame on those alcohol imbibing heathens but anyway the the you know it, it i think that there were a lot of reasons why if there were serious mental health issues or a personality disorder that she would keep it under wraps until until she felt some freedom to kind of let go. And I think by by her rejecting Jared and kind of getting back at him for not being into her initially, I think maybe she feels this freedom. My guess is this trainer she's with is probably more inclined to support the lifestyle that she moves towards. Yes. The, right. right. Whatever the, she the, wants to do. Yeah. Right. The, the trainer is probably more of an ideal in terms of being a little wilder. I mean, I, I you don't mean know. Mar Mario, not the trainer. No, the trainer. Because oh, the, the trainer, trainer. The okay. trainer would have been in the picture around the time she started doing this stuff. Got it. I see what you're saying. Not Mario. Mario, maybe to some degree. Mario comes later. So Mario, right. I th right. So I think they get she gets married to Mario in 2018. The trainer's back 2014-15. So, but it, it was 2014, 15, 2015 in particular, when she just starts really acting out and, and going off the deep end. So Liz, no stamping up for you. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> she says, I am LDS and enjoy enjoying a glass of wine, watching this wonderful live show. Just kidding, Liz. Well, but, it, at the very least, no cruise, Liz. If you join stamping up, you do, do not go on the cruise because you you won't have any alcohol, I promise. But unless you sneak it in. So, yeah. so yeah. So that so I think that's an interesting component in the sense that there could very well be some type of personality disorder that's kept under wraps, and then she kind of unleashes the beast and and becomes more of who she wants to be. She becomes a, a little more, you know, a little wilder, a little more off off the chain and um, which by the way, I mean, if I had to throw, I'm not diagnosing here, but there, there do seem to be kind of some borderline ish type qualities going on here. In also, terms of I sense, I kept j telling John, I was pointing out some similarities with some other friends of mine. And I have one dear friend who does have borderline and I love her. And I was saying there, are similarities here and I see some I see some characteristics of borderline personality. There you go, babe. 
Yeah. I said, so what do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you if you give me a stipend. Done. Um, the just yeah, the 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 instability. So in the in the in the original adjectives that I mentioned about that she's unstable and moody and attention seeking and controlling and entire those all would be kind of consistent. They could be consistent with narcissism, but they might also be consistent with borderline personality disorder, kind of the acting out, the tattoos, the genital piercing, like, you know, like that's pretty extreme. So when I think of borderline personality disorder, I think of those types of extremes. We talked about that a lot potentially with, like Lori Vallow Daybell, like yeah. she kind of exhibits some similarities here, I think too, to, to Shauna Gardner. So, um, we have quite a few new people here because this is a new case that has been shared around that uh, people interested, but a lot of people asking some questions and I would recommend you listening to our Daybell series, Lori Vallow Daybell, um, it's beyond the veil or go back. Um, we talk a lot about these questions. And if people here, I am not able to comment at all, guys, I've been trying. Um, so if thank you to those that are reminding people to like this video and to subscribe to our channel, um, it, it helps us a lot. So if, if you do want to support us, it means so much. If you can just give this a thumbs up, it helps the algorithms. And if you could subscribe to our channel and hit the notification button, you'll always know when we're going live. So thank you for being here for those new to us and to this case. Yeah. Go ahead, babe. Sorry. Intermission over. Keep going. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. So uh, the important element of the acting out though, is I think that type of behavior, I think it's the instability that's important in terms of, again, we're trying to figure out how someone like this can get to murder. It's, it's the instability and oftentimes with borderline personality disorder, and again, I'm not saying she has that, but if she did, a lot of one component of borderline personality disorder is rage. They tend to have a lot of anger and a lot of rage, especially when they don't get their way. And she wasn't getting her way with the custody battles. Jared was putting up a fight. Jared obviously wanted his twins to remain in his life in some way. And so she wasn't, she was used to control. She was used to getting her way. She was used to buying people's loyalty and love it wasn't working. So I think the, the rejection, the jealousy of Jared's new life and, and, and wife and lifestyle, and maybe this component of rage about being thwarted in her custody battle, even with all the money in the world, she, she still, she was dragging it out and really harming him, but in the end she wasn't victorious. So I, I think you probably have, you have those components of, of jealousy anger and rage and rejection that really kind of set the wheels in motion for this murder plot. Uh, and that's, that's how we got there. So, um, so that's kind of where I would land. And, and here we are. Yeah. There's some interesting things. I want to continue exploring it um, later, you know, uh, the, for next time, maybe the infidelity in this family is interesting to me that um, Shelly's father was married multiple times. Lynn Goodfellow, he just actually recently passed away, a businessman from Boulder City, um, Nevada. He, um, yeah, married many, many times. And then Sterling had an affair, of course. Shanna has an affair. There are many things I want to um, discuss further on this case that I find interesting. And I think that we're just actually, we have talked to several people now. Uh, thank you to those who have reached out, but I, I think that we hope to talk to many more. We hope to continue following this case. Um, I, I still have many questions. Um, and you know, we don't even, again, we don't even have a probable cause yet. Yeah. or an arrest affidavit. Every state calls calls uh, these things differently. So that's why, you know, I've reported in different states and they all have a different, they don't, we don't even have the, the records explaining um, the evidence they have. So um, there's a lot more to come in this case. And it is a heartbreaking, 
heartbreaking yeah. case. It children, is. Um, some children who have lost their father, other children who have lost both parents. Um, we see Shelly Gardner, the mother, the founder of Stamping Up, crying in the body cam footage. Uh, a few people pointed out, I want to say this, that, you know, perhaps Shanna was stoic for her children. I, I want to just delve back to that um, because I, I imagine some people would feel like she was letting her kids down and she realized that and she was trying to maintain some normalcy. But even then, you can say stoic and stay. I love well, you. Let me, let me let me comment on that. Let me rebut that quickly for a well, minute. Can I say something? Can I share a little bit more sure. then? I would love for you to rebut that. I received a text from a friend okay. who suffered an arrest in front of her children. And I'm just going to read a brief section of, of this friend of mine, her text. When she first watched the arrest, she sobbed. It brought back horrific memories. I was hysterical, emotional. Well, that that's already a difference right there. She was hysterical, emotional as the cops were there to take me away with two young children by my side. I was in a desperate attempt to give them normalcy. And I was desperately trying to help to calm them while also needing them to know that we respect law enforcement. Your mind is numb. You shut down, but the mother in you kicks in to protect your kids. You want to protect them at all costs. What, what would you like to say to that? Yeah. I mean, first off, she already mentioned she's emotional. Well, this, this gets into a larger issue about family culture. So let's, let's pick up on all these themes. So in the interview, the, in the one interview that, that Shanna does, there's a moment near the beginning where she cries and, but, and she feels bad about it. And she tells, she says to the interviewer, sorry, we didn't play that, but if you go back and watch that interview with with the news station, she actually apologizes for crying. So that suggests that she's not comfortable with it. It for someone who's reasonably healthy, they should be able to cry on camera and not feel badly about it, especially when they're talking about something so emotional that something as emotional as having a spouse or an ex spouse executed, tears should be fine. But she starts crying and she says, sorry, as if it's not okay. So clearly, this is someone who's not comfortable with those tears. And it, it doesn't even have to be tears. It could just be sadness or grief or comfortable with difficult emotions. Let's Being say vulnerable. That. Being vulnerable. Grieving. Just so, But that gets to a bigger issue about this family and this family culture. So, which, which has to do with what I would call a, so I think the family dynamic here is enmeshed, meaning that an enmeshed family is a family that essentially where all the members kind of see each other as one. There's kind of a fused identity. There's a closeness in terms of the family kind of closing ranks together and speaking for each other and kind of trying to be the same person. So that would be enmeshed. But there's another side. What's interesting in this family is it's an enmeshed family, but it's also, it's also a family that's disengaged. And when I say disengaged, I mean disconnected emotionally. That's an interesting dynamic because a lot of times enmeshed families will be in many ways overly connected emotionally. But that's not true here. So what's interesting about that is that to be enmeshed but disengaged means that you're trying to present the appearance of closeness, but without any connection, without any emotional connection. So again, getting back to this idea of this being a family that's more about money than emotion, it's similar to that, that the, the goal here for the Gardner family is to create the appearance of a perfect family with no conflict or turmoil. In fact, it's Shelly in her blog, I don't remember, you, you showed it to me, I don't remember. I don't have the date on this, but Shelly in her blog made a statement where she said something like, this is a horrible thing. Uh, please respect our privacy. And I think she said something to the effect of, we'd, we'd, you know, we'd ask you to respect our privacy and not discuss this or something, something like that. As if like, as if she can tell the public to, to basically not say anything negative or right like i mean 
yeah, right. That's a, that's a big ask, but right. I I certainly get respecting the privacy, but like asking for people not to discuss it and kind of shut things down. That's exactly what this family is, right? This is a family that they want to. They don't want that connection. They don't want people to look too deeply. They don't want to be embarrassed. They want to present this facade of being the perfect family. And yes, somebody just said Murdoch. Right? Exactly. Exactly like the Coxes and the Murdochs. Yeah, just kidding. He says right. Coxes, Murdochs. Right. It's all. It's if if right. If you want to right. Exactly. There's a lot of commonality that if if you want to again, we're trying to figure out how you can create criminals. These types of cultures do it. So these are very repressive cultures in the sense that they're more concerned about the way the family looks than they are about the emotional connections or the the attachments between the family members. And so I think you have that here. In terms of why Shanna is not comfortable with crying or emotion, it's because of the family culture. We were told a story about, um, about how on... Um, a lot of like with 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 stamping up. So interestingly enough, the stamping up cult, the, the culture of that organization is almost sim exactly similar to the culture of the Gardner family in the sense that open communication and expressions of emotions, honest emotions is not valued. What the person told us was that when things get difficult in stamping up or when there's different there's management issues that need to be discussed what they do is they have a pizza party or they go on a cruise, right? Or they go on a vacation. And so rather than, rather than, rather than diving into what's really going on and having an honest discussion about, you know, that, that probably involves an emotional level of emotions they're not comfortable with, you know, they would rather take a trip or have a pizza party and pretend that everything's fine. Right. So, uh Lamisa is say, stating there is still no mention of a murdered son-in-law of her grandkids on the blog, like hello. And KCL uh, continued that with correct. She calls on her blog an unexpected death. Like talk about avoiding the situation. And yes, they have made some statements now discussing supporting Shanna, but right. still not saying, you know, what's and it, going and on. Could that gets back to the type of family culture I'm talking about that it, it would be too painful and, and too reality based or too real to acknowledge that perhaps her youngest daughter was involved in a plot to murder her ex husband. That is not something that perpetuates this ideal of the perfect family and the Gardner family is the perfect family. They have the perfect marriage. They have perfect kids, right? And so this shatters all of that, obviously. Right, right. And I think people want vulnerable too, you know? Um, I think people might be feeling a little bit more warm towards them if they were a bit more vulnerable in their statements and shared empathy towards Jared and his family. Um, yeah. And it was, uh, yeah, the Curtin McConkie law firm in Salt Lake provided the following statement and I can't see the rest of it, darn it, but thank you, Melanie, for, for posting it there. But, but yes, th there is a statement that they made. And, and I think, you know, some of this has to do with, we talked about the affair when Shelly was 17 and you, for those who have followed us for a while, we know we talked about the importance of secrets in the Murdoch case and how secrets can get passed on through generations and how they can really impact families. And I think, you know, in a way, you have something like that here in the sense that there's the secret of right, there's the secret of infidelity that's starting this family. Right. And it goes back generations, as you point it goes out. Back. Lynn Goodfellow. Lynn Goodfellow, right. Shelley exactly. And Sterling. Shanna. Yeah. So you have you have you have a lot of secrets being passed along here and you know and and families that are trying to deny those secrets and bury those secrets and buried secrets, you know, like it or not, buried secrets are hard to keep buried. As you and always say, you always say it, John. You are a sane or a sick 
Those are secrets you keep. Right. This is really one of the one of the the, the lessons here is it you know it 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 doesn't pay to repress emotion and to keep secrets and to keep things hidden. And, you know, it's always a good idea to try to express things as openly and honestly and transparently as we can. And so I think, you know, in a way, this is a family that begins with a big secret and now potentially uh, and sadly and tragically, it could end with a really bitter secret of a murder plot. And, and that's really unfortunate. It is. This, um, Jared's widow, the mother to the two children, uh, the youngest, they had a six month old. She was home with her six month old waiting for Jared and their two year old girl Bexley to arrive home, wondering where they were for hours. Um, when she got a call from the police that she needed to come in that Bexley was okay, but she needed to come to the station. Um, if there's one beautiful thing that's come out of this, um, it's a nonprofit that the Bridegan family has started. Is this a good time to share this, John? Is there anything? Yeah, else please. Say? Yeah. And uh, we have the link to the nonprofit in the um, in the description of this video. And once this, this live ends, I'll also pin it in comments because it's beautiful. And if any of you feel moved to help Kirsten Breitigan, the widow in her quest, um, you can find that link uh, to the Breitigan foundation in again, the description of our video. But I think um, there is one beautiful thing that is coming out of this case. In, and we want to share that with you now uh, with a little video that was posted on the justice for jared b instagram page it's also another place you can go and learn more about this case and learn more about jared um the instagram page again is uh justice for jared b and then the facebook page is justice for jared b if you want to go there as well so this is something that kirsten posted um it's uh for those that are on our podcast and they're not going to be able to see this because this is a visual video, you're gonna have to read it. Um, this is the story of Bexley's boxes where uh, Bexley was alone at the police station um, after watching her dad murdered. And this is um, their solution to children who are witnesses or victims of violent crime when they don't have anyone around and what we can do for them to, to help them when that happens. Go ahead and mute, babe. So if anybody feels inclined to support Bexley's boxes, they've actually now have several across the country. You can head to the link in the description of this video. 
We are going to continue to follow this case. Our hearts and minds have been drawn to it. We're so thankful for the people who have reached out to help us prepare. And if anybody has any additional information, please write us at hidden true crime info at gmail.com. Thank you again, as always, uh, for your support, liking this video, subscribing to us, um, or heading over to our Patreon account, patreon.com slash hidden true crime also helps John and I continue our work. So thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for all of your support. And uh, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Dr. Babe. Yep. Thanks everyone. Thanks gems. We will continue and we're just grateful you could join us. Thank you. And you'll be getting a stipend later, babe. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Good night guys. Good night.